Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. Today I'm joined by James McPherson of Risk Fluent, and we are going to discuss James's operational risk framework. This is a recording of a safety roundtable, and it was one of the most well attended and also most interactive roundtable sessions we've had so far. And I'm pleased to say, as you will hear or watch, uh, as you join on this episode, it wasn't just an echo chamber. There were some challenges, there were some disagreements. And that is one of the great things that I want to promote on this podcast is discussion, debate and looking at things differently, because that's how we develop and make the world a safer place. Hope you enjoy this episode. If you get value from it, please do hit follow, share the episode with your networks and we can help to grow awareness of the podcast and join people on the mission that we've all got, um, which is positively impacting the world. So let's get to it then. Let's rebrand safety. Let's think about operational risk. Hope you enjoy this episode with myself and James McPherson. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week, we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints, and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms, and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Okay, welcome everybody to today's session. I can see lots of people uh, are joining uh, us on Zoom, which is great to see, and you can also be joining us here in lots of other different places um, around the internet to uh, watching this with us live. And you may well be watching this or listening to this in replay as well. So um, if you're with us now, then keep engaging, get involved. Uh, if you're taking this in after the event, then um, get involved on social media and let us know what you thought of it because um, we won't be able to sadly answer your questions uh, here and now. Um, live. But uh, for everyone else that is watching us and joining us now, then we look forward to interacting with you uh, as I'm joined today by the one and only James McPherson. Um, there he is with the, the best background I've seen so far on the Safety Roundtable. I was waiting for you to point that out. It looks like I'm in my daughter's bedroom. I'm not. I'm actually in like a co-working space. But as I turned the camera on, I was like, this does look like a child's bedroom, unfortunately. But that that was, yeah, that's not where I, I had just assumed it was your bedroom, James, to be honest. Um, but um perhaps uh, perhaps I perhaps I got the wrong the wrong end of the stick. <laughs> so we're gonna be talking uh today about operational risk success. And the background to this uh is that James has produced I'll tell you what, let me stop sharing. James has produced um this guide is that is guide the right word for it james uh that's what we call it a guidebook yeah a guidebook um which i've got my copy of i know james has got his copy because he was just showing me um so we're just gonna talk about this basically um before we get into it james uh do you want to just give a quick bit of background onto yourself in case there are anybody that that doesn't know who you are yeah sure um <clears throat> I always find this a bit really socially awkward. Um, but essentially, my name is James McPherson. I think I know I'm looking around at a few faces and names that I that I recognise. So nice to see some of you. Uh, I'm primarily from a company called Risk Fluent, but I also run a company called Risk Assessor. And then most people know me from Rebranding Safety. So uh, I'll run you through those really quickly. Rebranding Safety is pretty much where all of this stuff started. Um, so I've been a safety professional for about just over a decade, I think now. Uh, I started rebranding safety about five-ish years ago, I think it was, which essentially was a podcast when it started. Um, and it was probably more therapy more than anything, um, just from a, a lot of things in, in safety kind of frustrated me for a very long time. So I uh, therapized myself through that uh, podcast and too tight to buy actual therapy. Uh, and then eventually it turned out quite a lot of people uh, resonated with what we were talking about in there. And then that led to the consultancy business, which is Risk Fluent. Um, so with Risk Fluent, we kind of pretty much do two types of work. Uh, we do what we call technical 
consulting, which is kind of like what most people see as normal health and safety, like technical health and safety, if that makes sense. And then we do a uh, transformational um, consultancy as well, which is like what we're talking about back today kind of operational risk culture and human performance and all of that stuff um and then about uh, i don't know i think it was like may last year may, maybe march last year we took over um we took over risk assessor which is uh, an app for risk assessments and method statements primarily it does a couple of extra things but our bread and butter is risk assessments um so yeah we took that over at some point last year um just because I think kind of tech is is a very big part of the future of what we can do in safety so it was a nice opportunity to kind of take that over and now all three just kind of fill my diary and we we run through them as best we can good stuff um thanks uh thanks james and uh i'm, I'm pleased to say i don't know if there's any snooker fans but we're joined by john higgins I, I suspect it isn't the john higgins that's been playing snooker in saudi arabia but um it's his namesake, but um, I just I just spotted that and it made me smile because <laughs> snooker is is uh, is one of my pastimes, as as you know. So um, give us the background then, James, to to the booklet uh, and the, and the model. Um, you know what led you to work on this, put it together, and publish it. Uh, pretty much everything has come from rebranding safety. Um, so. Um, when I started rebranding safety, like I said, it was mostly just therapy for me for probably about the first six to eight months. And then uh, some weirdo called Christian Harris messaged me and said, hey, would you have guests on? Um, and we're like, oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah it's, and all my, said, it's all my yeah. fault. It's all my fault. Yeah, it is. It is literally your fault. And um, and you were the first guest that we had on. Uh, and then after that, we ended up just having a, a lot of guests on. Um, and I, at that point. Uh, thought I had the monopoly on this new way of thinking about safety. Um, turns out, unfortunately, there was a lot of people that were thinking like that. So unfortunately, I thought I was going to be really rich and wealthy because I was the only person that had this great way of thinking. Uh, turns out not so much, which is which is a good thing because I wasn't on my own. Um, so we started interviewing like big thinkers like uh, Todd Conklin, for example, Andrew Sharman, um, Carsten Bush, and then just also loads of like people just doing safety and also people not doing safety so we also had like premiership winning uh championship winning rugby players uh so i'm a big rugby fan so after i kind of started stopped fanboying um we actually had a good conversation around culture and stuff like that um so we had all of these people on rebound and safety and then what i was doing was essentially learning different ways to to approach different problems and i would go to my work and just if I'm honest, just mess around with it and see what worked and something to work. And, um, and then I also was obviously a big advocate of all of this new safety stuff that was coming out, um, which I know is kind of a, a controversial kind of debate most of the time. But ultimately, I was really a, kind of attracted by all of this safety differently, new view and all of that stuff. But I kind of really struggled to work out how to do any of it. Like I kind of got the theory, but like. Was struggling to do it so part of that was also trying all of that stuff out uh fast forward uh, many years about we kind of thought we could um we kind of worked out the way that we approach it the way that we think about this stuff so we thought if we can kind of build this into a framework it would help us uh but then also if we could build it into a framework and give it to everyone else uh as, as available as we can do um then we could hopefully help as many other people so the framework essentially is how to kind of start thinking about more broader ways of of approaching safety risk management and so on and that's kind of what brought the framework about the guidebook is is one of hopefully many so i kind of didn't want to write a book i wanted to write i'm a bit of a geek at heart so kind of wanted to do like comics originally like graphic novels i thought that'd be really cool if we did like a graphic guidebook or something uh but then i started asking artists and they were good would have cost me way too much money so we uh we just kind of worked it out ourselves and and this was kind of the halfway house if that makes sense um so it's the aim is to do like a series of them so this is number one and then there's some other stuff that will be coming out uh, at some point this year and then also for the following years to come and the aim is to help people just hopefully they can go and do it themselves if they can't do it themselves then obviously our businesses can help them out yeah perfect and i've pulled i've pulled up the page like we're, <clears throat> we're not going to run through this whole thing uh today because it's there's quite a lot to it but that is what the model kind yeah. of looks like and at the center of the model there are these kind of four key foundational pillars aren't there so I thought it would probably make sense for us to kind of introduce those 
and talk a yeah. bit around those points. And then, <clears throat> as always, guys, you know, everybody that's joining us, fire in with a question. So if you're on Zoom, uh, go to reactions, raise your hand, and we'll call you up and you can ask James a question. Um, if you're uh, watching this uh, somewhere else, uh, then just type it into the, into the comments and I will um, do my very best to monitor those. I can't necessarily guarantee I'll see those as promptly as if you're on the Zoom. Uh, Zoom is the best way to, to join us on this, uh, but we will do our best. So uh, let's start with um, reliability. That's one of the four foundations. Or do you want to give us the four first, James, and then let's go into reliability? Uh, yeah. Um, so kind of going through the framework, what, what, uh, the one thing I would say before we get into the framework is the aim of the framework is not to be a whole new way of of kind of a new model to stick to. Essentially, what I don't want is people going, are you behavior-based safety, safety differently, or are you risk-fluent? team whatever like it's, it's not a new model for you to kind of like religiously commit yourselves to it's 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 a framework to try and help you navigate those kind of safety differently new view behavior based safety and solve the problems that people are trying to solve with those things if that makes sense um so that's why we have those kind of four foundational areas is because when we've gone to customers either now as a consultant but previously in my employed roles we tend to be able to um kind of roughly put kind of problems in these little boxes and it's not to put them in a box to say that is rigidly where they stay but ultimately it's more just to help you navigate it in your brain because sometimes it's a bit um i can't see the wood for the trees if that makes sense so that's the framework is trying to help you think uh about approaching a problem um so it's to start off with reliability is one of the more technical um parts of of what we would call the framework um so reliability is essentially about two things risk management uh, and resilience so risk management being able to kind of foresee and deal with with kind of hazards and risks and so on and that's kind of what safety is been historically quite good at in my opinion uh, i think some of the stuff we do in in safety is the way that we manage risks, the way that we approach risk assessments, for example, I actually think are are really good in most cases. Um, got its areas that we could improve on, I think, but ultimately very good. So we're kind of taking, trying to take uh, the science around high reliability, around resilience, around risk management, and bring that into the framework. And then we have resilience, which is the ability, obviously, to deal with change and failure, but but still kind of continue on successfully as a business. Um, so they're the two aspects essentially of that. The third part of that would be kind of our mindset and our risk-based thinking. So reliability is about essentially a business being able to designing reliability, whereas we've kind of find that most people are reliable mostly, not mostly, but kind of with a, a large portion of luck, so to speak. So reliability is about designing in uh, a portion of reliability into the business. And, and the point about risk-based thinking um, particularly was interesting to me because um, I, yeah. I call my podcast safety and risk success because I kind of want to bring these two uh, aspects together. Um, mm. And you've called this a framework for operational risk success, not safety success. So I've been interested to know kind of why you framed it that way. And mm. from the perspe perspective of risk-based thinking, kind of how would you sort of define that? Um, and how is that different to perhaps a more traditional safety thinking mindset? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So essentially why we call it operational risk is because um, I genuinely believe that the way the core, the core aspect of what we do in health and safety, which is my kind of background, uh, is, is good risk management. That is what we do identifying hazards, identifying interactions with said hazard and then managing that interaction. That's kind of the way we would talk about risk management at Risk Fluent. That's what we do. If we kind of had a technical aspect of a hazard in safety would be like asbestos. If we were to take out the the bit of asbestos and then replace that with data, um, there's still a hazard to the business. It's still something that's potentially going to cause disruption to the business. So we would see, we would approach it the same. It's just a hazard, right? So it's kind of like what we're trying to do is declutter our mindset and our, our approaches and our management systems within work and just replacing it with one consistent approach to risk management by just saying that look, hazard is just something that's potential to cause disruption or harm or damage or loss or anything like that. Whereas essentially that's the same as for a phishing email as it is for drilling into a wall with asbestos. So it's about having one core 
uh, approach to your operations and designing in success within your operations. So that's why we call it operational success. Okay. And what about the sort of, yeah, how would you define the risk-based thinking versus, uh, you know, more of a, most people on this call are going to be health and safety professionals, you know, what sort of shift in mindset is is there involved in risk-centered approach versus a safety-centered approach? Yeah, cool. Um, well, no, not really much different. Actually, the, the, I think most safety professionals probably recognize most things that we talk about when we talk about risk, uh, risk-based risk thinking. One of my favorite models is actually Ransom Newton's dynamic safety model, which we talk about a hell of a lot uh, in our risk management work, which I think is it might still be in the knee wash. I don't know, but it used to be in the knee wash when I when I did it a very long time ago. But if people don't don't know what that is, it's kind of like the weird diamond triangle um, looking model that that helps you explore kind of the different types of failure and and buffers and all of that stuff. And it's a it's a really nice model. Um, we use that. And you, you would probably call that a safety model. I mean, it's called the dynamic safety model for God's sake. So it pretty much is a safety model. Uh, um, so we would talk about the different types of failure there. So we can't just talk about kind of safety failures. We have to be considerate of kind of in that model, you've got economical resource and performance is kind of what they talk about in that model. So we would say like, we would use that model to say look, the person in the middle, the dot in the middle of that triangle is trying to make a decision and they're actually trying to navigate all three of those failures at one point. So to just focus on one doesn't, doesn't really get much empathy to that person who's trying to navigate all three. It's just, it's just one example. Um, we talk about the flow of risk. So we talk about typically in safety, but not just safety. And we do it a lot in quality as well. We talk about it, um, all, we, we manage all the safety and talk about all the safety before we start the job. So we tend to do a lot of our risk assessment, our safe starts and all of this stuff. We do all of that, we, we've done safety and then crack on, we can do the job now. So it kind of like safety is out of the way, whereas actually the risk kind of flows with the aspect of time in that some parts of a job are higher risk and it's not always necessarily the start. So actually the start might be quite low risk and quite easy, but actually halfway through, there's a more high risk. So we talk about it in the, the sense of flow. Uh, and then probably the last thing we talk about mostly within that is likelihood and severity, which is very common within health and safety. But we we kind of talk about severity kind of at some point taking the lead over likelihood. So when something is really going to start to alter someone's life or even unfortunately lose someone's life then at that point likelihood needs to start kind of losing its weight so that's that's when we talk about the likelihood versus severity piece so essentially a lot of what we talk about in risk-based thinking is, is really pretty much from health and safety but we're just trying to apply that more broadly if that makes sense yeah i know that that does make sense and um and i really like that I, i'm a fan of um safety professionals kind of thinking more about risk and using the word risk because i think that that often can resonate more with you know boards and and uh, management teams uh, as, a, as a word shall we say because you know there's a lot of platitudes around safety as you well know because you asked me about it once at a trade show um whereas i think risk is something that yeah it, it just sort of sharpens the mind a bit more do you have any anything to that do you think yeah definitely i think half of um probably more than half, I mean, 90% of what we're actually trying to do is sell a concept within a business. Like even if you're internal safety manager or whatever, you're trying to, you're trying to say to people, Hey, come and come and listen to us and do, you know, do what we say kind of thing. And a big part of that is, is selling and, and kind of our branding and our marketing. And unfortunately safety or health and safety has a preconceived kind of brand. So a part of what we're doing is saying, actually, if you can think about safety like this, you can think about everything like this. And, and the way the narrative that we're talking about is trying to design a successful operation uh, as opposed to just talking about health and safety, if that makes sense. Uh, and there are times, obviously, a lot of the time we're a safety consultant where we do just talk about health and safety. Um, but ultimately, it's all contributed to the success of the operations, which businesses tend to, not all the time, but tend to kind of, buy into that a little bit more so yeah definitely is a brand consideration there if that makes sense yeah yeah no absolutely good good stuff um so the second of the four kind of pillars i suppose if that's the right term is um culture um mm -hmm. 
so that's that's a topic that obviously stirs up some um interesting and heated discussions sometimes in in our world of safety um i suppose the starting point of this uh would be are we talking about culture or are we talking about safety culture uh and why and then let's let's start to unpack a bit more about this after that yeah um are you talking about safety culture or culture it kind of depends on how what your problem is that you're facing essentially a culture is when we talk about a culture is just how people feel uh and then the store and all of that stuff that surround the thing that you're talking about so if we're talking about the business and it would be the culture of the business if we were talking about safety then it probably is the culture of safety um personally on that on that i think if we spent less time bickering about the debates uh, about the descriptions of something and whether it's a safety culture or a business culture or a bloody co quality culture or a finance culture we we probably might actually have got a little bit further than where we are now um but for me it's just the, the framework puts culture in there just to try and simplify it a little bit um and then to try and guide some thinking and there and then we we kind of try and break that down a little bit more into like leadership um kind of put what we call cultural foundations which is the use of like uh purpose and values and principles which we know from like simon cynic's work and some other amazing people around that the power of stuff like that but then we would kind of draw that down even further and saying how many times do you do just like a normal project and define what the purpose of that project is like sometimes i'll build a house you build a house that's what we're trying to do but like build a house and what like what does that house look like what's the quality of that house what's the pro what's the experience as we're going through that um kind of like you would do in sales you would go through the customer journey like kind of thinking about the purpose of it is to have xyz employee journey but also build a house if that makes sense yeah absolutely um the, the leadership piece um to what extent is this framework going to help us as safety professionals to improve kind of our leadership or is it more about trying to influence the broader leadership of the organizations that we're a part of um i again i mean i, I that's a good question christian when i feel like i'm giving you the same answer for everything which might be really boring for a webinar <laughs> um but essentially it kind of depends on the problem that you're facing so that again the, the point of the framework is to help guide your thinking so if you are talking about how the safety team are leading um within the business then we would be talking about safety leadership if we're talking about the leadership is in the slt within the business then we would be talking about those but essentially the the principles kind of are the same but how we do break it down in the framework is we we would pick out a difference between what we call strategic leadership which is people that are trying to steer the the wider sh the bigger ship of the business if that makes sense so like the the slt and i probably would put the safety team in there and that's probably where we are talking about safety leaderships senior leadership but then we also talk about operational leadership so we talk about people that are not necessarily in a leadership role um they're more on the shop floor they're the people that have influence on the shop floor they're the people that have have sway that that you know the there's those kind of natural leaders on the shop floor sometimes if i'm honest can be seen as a bit of a pain in the ass because they're normally quite vocal um and then depending on your relationship with them you might see them as as a really helpful necessary part of the of success in the workplace and it's about appreciating those roles those leadership people those leaders on the shop floor just as much as the people that have leadership in their title if that makes sense yeah, I like that. There's a few questions coming through uh, on the chat, which we'll start diving into. If you do want to um, uh, unmute, you know, put your hand, go to reactions, raise your hand, and uh, we can we can bring you up um, as well. Just coming into the the piece around purpose, um, how big a role have you seen that play in the success of managing this operational risk? In in other words, if the organisation has got a clearly defined purpose that people buy into to what extent does that make life much easier to deliver on the outcomes that the framework's trying to uh, to support with I, I think so interestingly um when i when i first kind of started working with this um i'd struggled to find any business that had a really strong purpose within their organization that that was tangible and actually worked through to the shop floor um 
and and I would probably only be able to answer that question back then based on what the academics say and the court leaders say, which they all say it's really important. And there, there is some amazing surveys, some amazing uh, academia out there that does show a lot of tangible evidence here. Um, kind of Daniel Pink, Daniel H. Pink's uh, work around motivation is really really interesting um so when you really start to look at beyond the kind of pay and incentivization of a role and daniel starts to look at actually people just getting enjoyment and purpose and belonging out something is really really powerful and interesting um so there's definitely a really a really kind of important power to purpose however in the last like year we have taken on a customer um that we've gone to that's um I just try and navigate this without without kind of talking about the uh, or giving it away who they are. Yeah, not being um, too specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so trying to navigate that, but ultimately they have a actually really strong um, purpose, and it's really clear. And then they also have really strong and clear values. And as the business has grown and taken on other aspects where they've kind of essentially taken on new businesses that have their existing min like mini culture and trying to bring them into their culture we've actually taken a lot of what they do uh, and brought it and, and learned from it ourselves and brought it into our work and it was really quite interesting to see we haven't done that they've done that themselves we're there actually helping them more with technical work um they've done that themselves and they've got like a framework the same as we have they've got like they call it their culture burger so they've got their culture burger that that is just consistent throughout the organization the purpose is clear the values is clear their behaviors and their decisions all structured around this kind of burger so to speak and it just works and it's so interesting to see um the power of it run throughout this entire organization it really does structure all of the conversations they have and it's everyone just talks about the purpose of this organization and it was mm. really quite nice to just kind of go in there and not have to convince someone that this stuff actually works uh because they've kind of worked it out themselves uh so it's quite easy for us in a way in a sense yeah yeah it's really interesting that isn't it because like you it's something that i believe to be true but finding the evidence of it is is harder to do yeah. and i think um it, it just it just supports this piece around leadership and selling that you were talking about before because actually being safe is a great purpose um i'm not saying that is going to be the purpose but it's actually a cause that we can all rally behind and it's something that can unite us all and actually get us to act on a set of values and and put in place certain behaviors um and, and do things in a certain way that should be a positive for for the business so yeah i was very interested to hear you um unpack that one um let's move on then to um human performance so is that the yeah. same as um hop human organization performance or is it something different uh, uh, again, there's, uh, there's not really anything new in this framework. It's about trying to help people kind of navigate it uh, to to really kind of try and provide some value. Uh, but but ultimately, it's just trying to help people do this shit. If that makes sense. So human performance. When I talk about it. Is, is no different from hop hop is just a brand um or a model that's that's very kind of proven in in my opinion. Uh, also, that's kind of what my educational root was so that's what i call it if i'm if i'm honest if we wanted to get in the debate between behavioral based safety and human performance in, in my opinion they're exactly the same um there are little slightly tweaks little slight tweaks in how we talk about things and how we would say uh maybe approach a problem i don't know but there are slight differences but the core the core founding kind of purpose so to speak or their core philosophies was probably the best way to say it i think is is the same so what i think different is just again trying to simplify it without oversimplification um to help people kind of approach it so we kind of talk about uh influencing behavior so simply put just how are you how are you influencing behavior with, within the business so look go and look into that go and have a look at the the structures you have in place on what is currently influencing behavior and, and is that the behavior you want and so on and so forth uh, then we would talk about building kind of people centered workplaces. So, uh, and, and again, coming back to bog standard safety, I think the Health and Safety at Work Act and what we've done in safety for, or what we've tried to do in safety for a long time, including people in risk assessments and designing that around how they experience work is 
that's the bog standard health and safety, or it should be. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just getting distracted by the questions. So I'll, I'll, we should probably come to some of the questions in a minute. Yeah, we will. Uh, we will. Don't worry. We will. Um, so yeah, talking about all of all of that stuff around, are we we getting all frustrated because people are not following safety or not following the rules or whatever? But ultimately, have we actually considered those people in that process? When we created that rule, so to speak. Um, so that's what we were talking about in that kind of that kind of people centered approach. The kind of this real simple example would be norman door there's a really good video that vice did which is dead simple uh, and it kind of communicates it through the the concept of a norman door which is just a great simple concept for everyone to get and then lastly we kind of talk about competence which sounds bog standard but we kind of add a couple of extra things in competence where we tend to talk about competence from the point of view of, of tasks um and we would talk about task competence but we tend to kind of forget this kind of social competence where a lot of people talk about soft skills so it, it's that basically but then also kind of risk competence so how are people how are we helping the business kind of or the people in the business sorry how are we helping them kind of think about think about how we're making those risk-based decisions how we are kind of approaching those those situations and so on so it's literally just a guide to kind of say think about this and then think about that and then think about this and then think about that if that makes sense yeah, no, that does definitely. So let, let's get let's get let's clear off the fourth uh, foundation, which is organizational learning, and then let's delve into the questions. And I've got some more questions yeah. and comments and stuff as well. So there's there's plenty going on in the chat. So uh, so that's good. Um, so organizational learning. Um, what do you mean by that? How do you define that? Why is it important? Um, and and you know, if people don't have that as a sort of key uh, foundation or pillar of this model, yeah. what could sort of go wrong? So organizational learning really is, again, just as just giving you a guidance to be able to think about where you are learning. So how are you getting all these data sources back? So we're saying be people centered, but how are you learning all of that stuff, if that makes sense? So how are you getting the data that tells you how to tweak and how to kind of adjust where you need to? So typically in safety, one of the things that we don't do very well is learn from anything other than just stuff going wrong. So in safety, we tend to um, learn when things go wrong. And, and I think we're probably one of the best at that. But ultimately, there are many other things that are going on in the world, which we could learn from before something goes wrong. So we talk about learning from success. And we talk about just learning from normal work, which is really common uh, and popular kind of phraseology within human or organizational performance. Um, and then we also talk about learning from I think I said learning from success, but we would we would kind of say, not enough of us in business world, but particularly in safety, kind of do learn from the fact that we've done this amazing project, but why did we do this amazing project so well and without kind of hurting someone or killing someone, for example? Like, why are we uh, as good as what we say we are? So we would go, hey, we've had no accidents for the last five years. Okay, great. Why have we had no accidents? Without just going, because we've got risk assessments, like, but actually going, why are those risk assessments working and then really stress testing things, uh, if that makes sense. And is it just luck as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we use that phraseology quite a lot, like design versus luck and so on. Uh, we would also talk about, uh, we, this is probably the main section where we start to talk about workers done versus, versus workers imagined. So managing that organizational drift and understanding how big the gap is between the two. Is there a gap? And so on. Um, so having some kind of fingers on the pulse of the business to see what reality is versus what safety is. And there's a lot of really amazing work there around um, kind of what uh, David Provan and Drew Ray did and their paper around safety clutter and um, a lot of stuff. What they did was really good. We talk about that a lot uh, in our work. And then finally, we talk about a lot of psychological safety within there. So like talking about whether people are motivated to speak up most of the time we talk about whether people are feeling safe to speak up my experience particularly in the uk most people feel very comfortable to tell you what they think about their uh, the business that they work in what they often don't feel comfortable with or, or what they don't have is motivation to speak up uh, most of the time so if you go and ask them what do you think of the business nine times out of ten they'll tell you um but they, they're just not motivated to come and tell you because they've told you before and no one's listening kind of thing so we talk about psychological safety within there i don't again i, I will caveat that by saying i don't think that's anything new i think amy's work is really clear on motivation 
Uh, I think the work to Amy is also really clear on motivation and also trust with the organisation in there as well. Uh, I just think some of the narrative that come off the back of that, we seem to have missed those points. So that's why we kind of put it in the framework, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's all. Uh, that's all. That's all good. So we've covered the four key uh, pillars. Um, where would you say people are? I say people. I mean organisations are typically strongest. And where would you say people are? Or organisations are uh, typically sort of weakest across those four areas. And I, I understand that the four break down into into other sub uh, categories as well. Mm, good question. It does vary. I find like like uh, some some cult some businesses are like so good and have, with with like their cultural relationships within the organisation. Leadership is really good uh, and so on. And and then you go to other, but they're really crap at technical. And then you go to other businesses and they're just like really good at kind of technical risk management, but not so good at other. It does it does massively vary. I think we are really really good at building particularly within safety, we're really, really good at building good, strong, structural kind of systems within an organization, um, like scaffolding for the for the business, so to speak. I think we're phenomenal at that. I think badges and accreditations, I give them a bad rep a lot of the time. They get a bit of a bad rep in this in this book and in some of Carson and Bush's work, they get a bit of a bad rep as well. Um, but they are valuable to the business, right? So we're, we're phenomenal at that stuff as well. Um, demonstrating safety, I would call it as a risk. So people, uh, being a, us being able to demonstrate safety to external stakeholders, um, we, we're phenomenally good at that. We're really, really good at that. Um, but as for like technical details whether it's like most people are really good at reliability but m some people are really good no one's very good at human performance it, it kind of doesn't work like that a lot of people um do, they vary there's huge variation but but typically i'd say in the uk which is where we do most of our work we do work outside the uk a little bit but most of our work is in the uk i'd probably say one of our biggest areas potential areas for growth would probably be our, our approach to the people of the shop on the shop floor um but also the approach from the shop the relationship from the shop floor upwards so like we have this movement within kind of i'd say like maybe safety differently but like i don't don't not just sydney's work if i was going to collectively bring them all into one if that makes sense like new view safety there's a huge move between like to push us to listen to the shop floor, which I think 100% we need to, that's so important. Um, and then the deference to expertise is like a really, well, we quite enjoy that, use that phraseology quite a lot. The desperate deference to expertise being deferred to the expert in the room. And when we talk about work, we are talking about the shop floor. The shop floor is the expert of work. Um, what we seem to have done is applied this real like empathetic, like deference to expertise approach to the shop floor but we, we seem to have very little empathy for these business leaders that are also humans um so we kind of approach leaders and e of these big organizations with this real kind of um like la approach of lack of empathy lack of flexibility and the relationship between the two is is kind of frayed uh, i'd say we find that quite consistent um is how we approach the shop floor from how we approach the, the the top floor so to speak and, and vice versa there, there's just a breakdown in relationship between the two mm. it's really interesting that isn't it because people are people at the end of the day and mm. i always say to, to to people if i'm advising them on you know whether it's safety or growing their business or whatever they're, they're asking me about how could i do this better i tend to say find what's in it for them so whoever it is you've got mm. to convince to, to, yeah. and to influence, you know, what's in it for them and try and understand them with that radical empathy. Um, and I think sometimes we sort of perceive that, you know, if they're the managing director or the COO or whatever, um, they must have been there, done it and know exactly what they're doing and not have any problems and be totally in control. And, mm. and that just isn't the case, is it? No, no. And they're, they're just these like two, we kind of, well, when I talk about it, I, I tend to talk about, a lot, use the, the analogy of a tree. So like um, the bush at the top of the tree uh, is kind of like the, this, the SLT, the directors, board of directors, right? And they can't see the, the roots and the roots is the shop floor. They can't see it because all the mud in the way, right? And then the roots can't see the bush either. Um, so they've, they've got no 
connection other than the trunk but the trunk is a lot smaller than everything else so we've got this like bottleneck of information that kind of comes in filters everything out and then spreads out the bottom and vice versa um so we kind of talk about it like that but they've all got these different perceptions of each other which most are kind of wrong like the shop floor seem to think that if at the instant you're a director you're kind of minted and then the the directors seem to think that because you're on the shop floor if you're kind of raising issues you're just a pain in the ass kind of thing and it's there's just kind of this breakdown in relationship and, th and we see this exist in tiny businesses all the way up to big businesses there is just mm -hmm. this weird breakdown uh halfway through that kind of tree trunk if that makes sense yeah and and, and the tree trunk the tree trunk is um you know analogous to a conversation or a relationship and if you've got that if you haven't got that um relationship and you're not open enough and willing to have a a difficult conversation with but, but, but bearing in mind that just just because you're having a difficult conversation doesn't mean that that's going to spoil the relationship mm -hmm. um arguably you know not having that difficult conversation is what will spoil the relationship in the long run because if you don't have those mm -hmm sort of more difficult conversations you kind of breed resentment and then you know if you yeah. if you have resentment for somebody which is kind of what you were saying there you know there's a little bit of envious resentment shall we say going up but you know i'm i'm just sort of stereotyping uh, and there's the yeah, kind yeah. of resentment going down and that's because there's a lack of communication yeah and, and you know what it's been really interesting like as running a business myself over the last couple of years like we're still relatively young from business director point of view so to speak um we we've had to try and apply principles to ourselves and and really realize how how challenging a lot of this stuff is and when we've had situations where we needed to have like an awkward conversation i think one thing we have done really well within the whole team is all of us have jumped on it as quick as possible and just had the conversation um yeah. and, and we kind of gone in with with a, with an approach of like the, what is the problem and how can we kind of solve that problem i think a lot of the time we we tend to go into this conversation of we, we tend to go in every conversation and we say that we don't but most of us do as a kind of human race into going to every looking for who's at fault so we'd be like oh the the, the senior managers are at fault because they made this decision oh no it's the middle managers at fault because they filtered out all the important shit or it's a shop floor at fault because they didn't listen we do it in safety as well like oh bbs is shit and safety differently is better and vice versa and we just argue mm. and, and we're always looking for one that's better than the other instead of just trying to find something that, that works for you in that moment might not be the thing that works for you in the next moment but it works right now to just have those kind of conversations but more importantly the conversation should be framed around the the narrative of let's try and find a solution so we try and find out what's going what's going on what don't you like that, that's happening and then what do you want that kind of what does kind of success look like even though that's a bit of a cliche nowadays but um that narrative of how we go into and again coming back to models like we spoke about earlier i always, I always wonder if i pronounce it wrong but batari's box is a really old classic model but like my attitude affects my behavior and then my behavior affects your attitude uh, yeah your attitude your attitude affects your behavior then your behavior affects my attitude so for example if i come into this with a really shitty attitude it would it would affect everyone else in this call and so for example if anyone else comes into this call with a really crappy attitude or a negative attitude it will affect somebody else's behavior within here so that that kind of narrative of going into it is so so important but i don't think we appreciate how important it actually is mm -hmm. yeah I, I i um i'm guilty of um not being very good at having those difficult conversations it's something i'm like working on and uh and trying to be better at but so i can really see um that there's a huge benefit to just recognizing that and also i think the, ben the beauty the... of oh sorry Go question coming oh, i'm sorry no, i was just going to say that when we when you said earlier about about purpose and values and principles like that that's the value of that stuff is mm. it's so much easier to have a difficult conversation if you know that we're all in it for the same purpose we're, we're all trying to get the widgets out of the door then in a way the the awkward conversation becomes easier because you know you're guided by the frameworks of the business mm. so to speak and the frameworks of yourself
yeah and it's and it's the same in in personal relationships as well isn't it you know if it's your friend uh, or your partner or, or whatever your family member then there are going to be these things which are much more important most likely than this particular thorny issue you need to deal with that are kind of binding you together and should yeah. give you that kind of ability to uh, to have that sort of challenging uh, discussion yeah. and, and kind of go from from there um, yeah. So there's lots and lots of questions uh, in the chat. I'm struggling to get through them all. Um, if anybody wants to actually kind of come and have a chat with James and I, then um, then go to uh, reactions, raise your hand and, and unmute. But I'll, I'll start working my way through uh, some of the questions. But before we do that, um, <clears throat> I asked you the question about where where do people typically do better and, 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 and not so well or where they've got room for improvement for a reason, because I'm the master of the segue. Um, tell us about the scorecard and how people can go away and assess kind of how they're currently getting on based on the framework. Uh, yeah. And then I'm just looking at, I'll pitch out a couple of questions. Um, okay, I'll, cool. answer, I'll, I'll go through a couple of clays as well. Um, clays on fire so, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, clearly. Um, hello. Um, so the scorecard, yeah, good question. We've got two scorecards on the website. The scorecard is, is for the operational success scorecard is based around the framework. So the aim of that, again, is to try and help people just pick out some areas to kind of focus and get started. All of this stuff is just about trying to help people see the wood for the trees. So, um, you know, is, is there a kind of a marketing and, and kind of lead generation aspect to it? Of course there is. Like we're trying to run a business, right? But ultimately what we're also trying to do is is give enough to help people. So a book, um, if you want it in hard copy, you can get it off the website. But ultimately you do the scorecard, you get the, the framework and a PDF free of charge. So you kind of get a little bit of a guide as to where your problems might be. And then the framework should help you kind of try and approach that, that thinking. So that's what the scorecard is for um so Perfect. i think one of one of uh, clay's first questions um was do i know what's wrong with safety i think was one of them um yeah so i think he was sort of saying that um we need to be a bit more introspective and and sort of see ourselves as the safety profession as being a key part of the problem rather than building what you were just saying about blame i suppose um yeah. so yeah, and the, and the, with the conversation not providing any real value either. So thanks for that, Clay. Appreciate that, mate. Um, but let's see if I can um, let's see if I can have a look at your your kind of uh, poor problem with safety. I think if no would be the answer. I don't. I don't because I don't know if there is a core problem with safety. Um, I think everyone has different problems with with safety. Some people are really good at safety if i'm honest um but they're not good at other things um and I, I would say it massively varies with each one and part of my part of my kind of frustration which led to the framework which of what what we've kind of done is and I, we actually i think is still in the intro for rebound we might have changed the intro for rebound safety but it was in the intro for rebound safety for a very long time Went on a little rant that said everyone was looking for one solution to a problem um but but there isn't one. behavioral based safety is right because we're all looking for one thing so we're all looking for what one problem and one solution um kind of thing so that was oh it just said my connection's unstable have you still got me christian I'm yeah i've still, still got you james you cut out oh, a couple of, couple of times but it's fine yeah yeah Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm on, on shared Wi-Fi, so it might uh, might top out. But but yeah, essentially, my 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 answer, Clay, if I'm honest, would be I, I I don't know if there is a core problem. I would say we all have many different problems. Um, and it and actually, if you just accept that there's probably more than one problem, and there's also probably more than one solution, um, then maybe we would we would start kind of moving forward, so to speak. Yeah, Jonathan's put a sort of follow up question to this uh, in the in the chat which is do we think that the health and safety profession is guilty of over complicating and adding unnecessary complexity to uh, our management systems and that's what's disengaging people what's your view on that james um i i've no i've been unpopular in the past for saying that i don't think the safety profession is as, as accountable for um kind of the last the lack of improvement over the last kind of decade or more um but I would, I, what I would probably say to that is that there's context to everything, right? So 
if if we were to say, oh, safety overcomplicate things, there's probably a reason as to why we're overcomplicating things. And and I actually think that the, the HSE did a really good paper. It was during the kind of Tory red tape campaign where they were trying to blame safety for all of the red tape stuff. And the HSE did a really good paper on the uh, on the legislation to see if the legislation kind of drove um, UK health and safety to have all of these crazy paperwork and stuff. And they were kind of, well, not really, actually. It's, uh, it's more like stakeholder relationships and insurance and all of this stuff that actually drive all of this requirement for paperwork. So we could sit here and say, oh, the, the safety profession need to be kind of accountable for stuff. I think, yeah, we do. But I wouldn't say accountability is blame. I would say accountability was us, would be us saying, hey, we're just trying to find a new way to do something now because we think that uh, that other way of doing this particular thing is not working anymore. That's accountability for me. That's not like saying the safety profession are, are horrendously shit and need to like completely change what they do and all of this stuff that's that's not accountability that's blame um so for me accountability is what we're doing currently which the safety profession is doing really the profession is doing really well which is being quite self-critical and self-reflective of ourselves and having debates and and kind of reading about stuff which i think we do quite well we could probably stop debating as much and start doing that would probably be better but ultimately um i think we are uh, I think we are accountable, but I think we're holding ourselves to account, which is which is a good thing. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but that would be my my kind of stance well, on it. Well, Jonathan's put his hand up, so why don't you why don't you come unmute Jonathan and see tell us yeah, the answer if James has answered the question. Thanks. Um no, it's it's not a comment of driving blame, but my experiences are that we in this profession we overcomplicate things and add complexity. And I'm not saying there is one thing that drives that. You've yeah. got um, you know, you, you've got your customers, you've got um, ISO standards, you've got so many cogs that ultimately create this complexity. Mm -hmm. And what we tend to find is sometimes it's knee-jerk reaction of putting in a policy, yeah. doing a yeah. risk assessment unnecessarily. And, and we're very reactive to the environment and we are all put under different pressures. And I think lots of things is pressure driven to add this complexity. But also, I think some complexity is added to the management systems from the health and safety profession because of sometimes it's a lack of understanding the actual risk that we're dealing with. Um, and it's okay. going belts and braces. And the issue with that is when we're adding complexity to our systems, uh, with anything, when you add complexity, there's more chances of things falling over. And the more complexity we add, we're making, we're making it more difficult for the operators to actually do the task. So as a result of the operators finding the task more complicated because the whole management system is being overcomplicated, where we find is that people actually then take shortcuts. So what I'm trying to say is that in the profession ourselves, you know, we, we all have to look inwards. You know, I'm a health safety professional like everyone else here, I imagine, is is looking at ourselves and thinking, okay, do we really, really need to do this? And what is the outcome of us doing this? And are we running the risk of, as I said in the comments, disengaging people, but causing people to call, to take shortcuts because of how we've managed the system? And as yeah. I said before, it's various things that cause us to do these things. Um, it, it's not one thing, yeah. but there's lots of stress, complexity, different requirements from different stakeholders and it's that and it's actually the profession standing up and saying actually by us going down this line we are making things more challenging than they really need to be so it's the health and safety professional to actually to stand up and say no we shouldn't be doing this this is the line that we should be going down yeah yeah mate, it's, a it's a difficult balance though isn't it as well i think because if you look in if you look in my area for example um of of trying to prevent people from slipping over I, I would say we're almost too far the other way we're not quite thorough enough so we need to be a little bit more complex and that's why it's still proving to be such a thorny issue that we're not able to solve so it's it's all about the balance isn't it yeah i, yeah, I, I think, think that's potentially right. like a, oh sorry jonathan sorry, James. no 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 I, what i was going to say is that that comes back to the same point that we all tend to oversee or forget about is it's being reasonable and proportionate that is what the legislation mm -hmm. says that is what we do as professions is 
what we should be doing is reasonable proportion to the level of risk. And you're absolutely right, Tristan, in, in, in terms of sometimes you can see it's the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, and it's trying to get that middle, that middle ground. And it is challenging. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I think as well, like I, I find a lot of the time the the safety the the safety profession could do a better job of helping the safety profession if that makes sense like a lot of the time we are in like if you have if you think about construction for example it, it's a very kind of us and them relationship so like if we're looking after our customer um we're the safety profession for for that professional for that business and then we're kind of sending stuff to their customer which is have the safety team and it, it, the relationship is automatically before we go into it like really us versus them so it would it would take i think quite a brave safety professional of a smaller business to say no we don't need that actually and we're not going to implement it but what we tend to find is because we've had those conversations jonathan where we've said to the customer you, you don't need that. That, that that's absolutely stupid like you're adding layers of paperwork that you don't need you're adding complexity blah 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 um but essentially the response we get back is this customer says we have to have it and it's a six million pound contract and if we don't have it we're going to lose this contract um and then and you've got all of these weird complex, which I think you, you've you've touched on, Jonathan. That we we live in this weird world of all these different pressures, um, and I think just having a conversation around someone's health and their safety is pressure enough. Uh, and then we've got all of these kind of commercial economical pressures as well. But I think you're right. I think I've done it myself one of my first safety jobs we had an incident and then my response was to implement a pap uh, a paperwork uh, kind of checklist. Um, and then about two years later, we kind of had discovered kind of decluttering and all of this stuff, uh, kind of went back in and ended up removing that paperwork that just stood there collecting dust. And I think we'd done one of the forms, um, cause it wasn't solving the problem, but it was making me feel a little bit better because I'd, I'd implemented something. Um, but what I hadn't done is implemented something that actually worked, if that makes sense. So I think we do have a bit of knee-jerk reaction and influence stuff. I think Grenfell is a good example of that as well. Like Dame Judith Hackett came out the back of Grenfell uh, and said one of the biggest problems in construction is the complex, the complexity around building a compliant building. And and what we've done as a kind of nation is implement two more, I think two more pieces of legislation and a new and a new enforcing body. For me, that's just more complexity. Um, so. So yeah, I, I think I think you're touching on really good, important point, Jonathan. Good stuff, um, Craig. You've had your hand up for a while, so uh, do you want to unmute and and uh, jump on board and give us a question or some thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the thing is, is that um, you, you're all talking the, and please take this not being sarcastic. A, a health and safety professional, environmental and quality uh, of twenty plus years. But I think you said it before, there is no one fit that fits all. And that's where some of the complexity comes in. The mm. problem that you've got, uh, and I'm, I've done cultural behavior, habits, and teaching training, etc. The problem that you, we've got as professionals and as a business community, like I said before, there's a lot of complexity because a lot of other models, a lot of other strategies come into health and safety. And that creates a lot of gray areas. And you were saying about responsibility. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, your responsibility. You're also talking accountability and liability. The main issues that any, any business or any client as a consultant of many years and have worked with major players to small to mediums, the problem that we've got is you've got to go from bottom up as well as top down. And that's where a lot of people miss the the golden nugget in so much as that um, somebody said before, I think on one of the questions or one of the comments about Australia bringing in psychological elements, it's gotta be the right type of psycholog psychological element to know how people want to learn. And that's, it, that's a case of how they learn, what they're gonna learn or what you need them to learn, but also then the key thing is, is do they want to do it? And all I'll say from my psychological elements as in training is that there's only one person who can change that person who's looking in the mirror. And it's that person who's looking in the mirror. And that's the challenge that we've got as health and safety professionals. We can do a lot of things and we can put a, 
a lot of scorecards and I'm not having to go at anybody's system, but it's got to be relative to that business, to the risk, to the culture or to the, the strategy and want of the person from the top, but more importantly, from the person at the bottom of how they are going to then try to create their own value to it, their own standard and say, right, I'm not coming to work to get hurt. I've got the potential. What am I going to do to stop me getting hurt? Right, I'm going to follow this system. I'm going to follow that risk assessment, method statement, whatever, and permit. But the thing is, is that if they don't see value in it and they don't think that it's being followed through from the top down then, and it's just a tick box exercise or it's an insurance or assurance point of view, where where'd you go from there? Because the thing is, is that it's creating those, I think I've said it before, standards and values, but don't always think it's just top down. It's got to be bottom up. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> um, Sorry, that, that's my rant over. But, but but it, it, I think it's quite good. I think it, I think it is good. Um, and, and we kind of talk a lot on rebound safety and, in, and within risk learning around like this kind of safety is originally intended. What we're trying to achieve is safety is originally intended. If you look at the health and safety at work out, I think I think it's clear. It's always asked it to be reasonable and practicable and talk to the shop floor. Um, yeah, but it's grey. Think... It's very grey because when you go into a court of law, which I've been done as a, an expert specialist for defending somebody after they've had fatalities, the problem is, is that what one ex inspector says to another inspector, to another one judge, to another judge, to another one court, to another court, we yeah. we've we've got a very, how can I put it, we've got a very um, intuitive system, we've got a very intuitive professionals, but going back to the the gentleman before, we we've got to make it complex sometimes to cover the insurance and assurance and yeah. to cover the CEO or director or the board. The thing is, is that, and, and I mean, I, I, what I usually say and GDPR or whatever, simple, stupid is the key. We make things too complicated because of what that person is trying to do to make sure that they either cover the business. And don't get me wrong, business risk is important. I know that from a quality point of view. I put business continuity models in place, um, UK and abroad. But the thing is, is that it's getting the right set of standards and values so that anybody and everybody can say, right, if I work for you, and like I said to you before on my, my statement before about induction, you set it from day one. How many people have an induction for half an hour or an hour? And it's a case of it's a tick box. There's no, there's no test at the end of it. There's no, do you understand it? It's just a case of, right, there you go. Along you go. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's interesting with, with the whole thing around, um, again, in, 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 my, in my field, right? If, if something goes to court, uh, what it tends to boil down to is the result of a slip test. Mm, but yeah. what we're what we're told uh, by the Health and Safety Work to Act is to take reasonably practicable steps, and then some yeah. people are saying, "Well, it's not reasonable or practicable to have a slip test." I, I disagree with that personally, but um, they haven't done it, and then and then but then it all boils down to not were they doing things that were reasonably practicable in their mind, but does it pass this yes or no black and white? So why not be a bit more focused in oh, some Christian, aspects all, all um, i'll say is is my an old colleague of mine who's just retired from the hsl in derbyshire he's done hmm. slip testing for 20 odd years why can't we introduce something to that model or to that standard and go you know what you've you've been looking at it for how many years what can we do to make sure that there's something of a set standard in place but yeah, too many people are scared of putting the, the the head on the chopping block, including yeah. the HSE sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Kate Kate says she hates slip testing. Right, that's it. Your band, your band, Kate. Sorry, <laughs> can't come, can't come anymore. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, James? Before we go over to Alex, uh, with, without without kind of running the risk of of going on forever, I, 
I'm not sure I 100% agree. I agree on a lot of things that you've said, but not not essentially the the end outcome of like we just need to kind of set consistent standards. There are there are so many different businesses that do that do so many different things. I don't think you could set like one standard and and get more specific and less complex or less grey legislation. I actually think our legislation in the UK, yes, it has flaws, one hundred percent. I think uh, Pro Van and Ray did a really good um, couple of podcasts. I think on goal based legislation versus um, the other one, like the more prescriptive approach. I think the US take. Um, and there are pros and cons to both, um, but but actually, I think the flexibility that we have is is beautiful and i think it's really good and i actually think jonathan touched on i think jonathan and terry actually have touched on one of the bigger problems here is that consistency of the standard of delivery of those those legislation is one of the biggest problems so maybe instead of regulating the system we should potentially regulate the profession and create the, a more consistent delivery method of stuff uh, as opposed to a more consistent model of regulation, if that kind of makes sense for the businesses. Um, I, I think there's some legs in that. I'd be interested if it ever happens because I think a certain professional body might lose too much money if you did something like that. But we'll wait and oh, see. James, I thought I thought you were going to stick away from that for once, but um, you no, couldn't help yourself, could you? James, can I just check how are you doing on time? I'm not under. I'm happy to carry on for a few more minutes. Are you okay to do that? Yeah, or? I can do another five minutes, and then I will have yeah. to crack on unfortunately. But yeah, I, uh, Naomi's put her hand up like five times. I think. I mean, yeah, she had, she, she keeps putting her hand up and putting it down again. So Naomi, <laughs> let's call you up, and then we'll, we'll get to Alex as well, and then we'll wrap up. La we'll go ladies first. Go on. Hi guys. So Hi, like yeah. this is actually a conversation extremely dear to me and it's actually one of those big things that I want to tackle in the WHS industry in Australia so not just uh and if I can get global well hey I'll you know I, I, goals hopes and dreams um I re I'm going to come in hard and fast and defend the Australian model because it has a very good balance of both so wow. we have what Craig was talking about with the extremely regulated, very, very black and white legislation, black and light reg regulations, black and white standards, and they're extremely high. And um, it, it, our, 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 the way we do it is great. <laughs> I'm really, really proud and very uh very proud to be learning in, in the Australian industry that's for sure um it no it doesn't have the flexibility because it's not inflexible for a very good reason um but what you do find in that is exactly what you were talking about James is those people that come out and they're inflexible in their way of thinking so they come out and they be like what it says is this is this and this and so it's like yes that's what it says but exactly what you said, how are you delivering that to the people? So um, I know in my business, the way I say, I said to my people in order to get them to sign on, you know, to their JSAs, onto their, onto their swims, follow their hierarchy of controls and their, their own personal risk assessment, do their take fives. The way I do that is I have to sell that as this is your insurance. Um, it's like you pay your insurance every month, you pay your car insurance, I said, I, I said, I have no idea about anything in your job. They're um, electrical uh, electricians. We're an electrical engineering company. And I say, I have no idea about anything to do with your jobs. I said, but what I do know is my job. And I said, it, and I've said to them in a toolbox store, if you do this, it makes my job five times easier because I know that you understand the processes that are in place. Those black and white we this is a high risk therefore we're going to do this so um we can you know go home safely at the end of the day so it's mm. very black and white like you can't argue with it so um our laws even stipulate um that the worker has responsibility to follow what we've put in place and if they actively choose against it they're actively choosing to not follow work health and safety laws regulations um, and stipulations therefore the fault and the responsibility falls on the worker they are responsible for their own health and safety in that regard following the what the business has put in place um mm. so it's really great that it's black and white like that but again it's that delivery 
from the person and I know this and I know he's not in here, which is great. <laughs> uh, my, my opposing worker is very much the other side of the coin, which is um, he doesn't care. It's like if it's written there in black and white, well, they have to do it. It's like, well, yes, they have to do it. But how are you delivering that um, to get them to sign on to that, that uh, job safety analysis every single day? How are you getting them to pick it up and go for another walk around to make sure that, you know, they've covered everything in it? Um, and and it's getting that buy-in from your workers. So yes, there can 100% be those black and white. This is what it is. I there's nothing I could do to change it, but it's how you deliver it. So, but that's how we do it. We're like, this is law. There's nothing I can do about it. What can I do to make your journey more comfortable in getting to that? So we can both uh, work toward that same goal kind of thing. And that's how we work in Australia. So anyway, that's my little rant. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, sounds good. I like it. Thanks, Naomi. Uh, Alex, you've had your hand up for a while as well. Come on, give us yep. give us a good uh, a good uh, question to. It's a, it's a question for for Chris and James, uh, and something that I've learned over the years uh, by myself was that we need communication skills as health and safety managers. And James touched upon uh, personal branding, and I would try to extend it to senior people in here who are heads of uh, health and safety departments about department branding. So are there any, uh, I don't know, any uh, tips and tricks, any recommendations that you gents have for people in here on how to better uh, communicate with their, uh, uh, that with the directors that they're working under, with the uh, managers that they're working at the same level and with the people uh, in lower uh, lower ranking positions and how to brand brand themselves as not just the person with a clipboard in their hand, but also part of the business and part of uh, a larger uh, thing than just themselves. Thank you. What a question. Um, I've, I've, so I've got a couple of things I want to add, but, but before I do that, I want to give a shout out to Peter, who's part of my team, uh, who's in, in the call. Um, he He's done a lot of stuff around this in the past um, that, that I love. Uh, so Peter often talks with our customers um, about like, do you have a communication strategy for safety? So like, this is your this is your stuff that you're trying to roll out within the business. Do you actually have a strategy in how you're communicating that stuff out to the business? Um, Peter was the person that kind of introduced me to that um, many years ago when I first talked to him on a, on a similar call to this, really. Um, and I was like, well, bugger me. Yeah, I've never really thought that, actually. Because uh, we often kind of, and, and this kind of uh, follows on from Naomi's point as well around we kind of go, um, you, we, you, you have to read this risk assessment because under the section X of the Health and Safety at Work Act, you have to co uh, collaborate with us. You have to work with us and cooperate, right? So we just go, you have to do it. But that's not getting their buy-in and getting them to go, yeah, I get why I have to do this. So having like communication strategies instead of just kind of doing it um, is is always a great thing. Um, I was just trying, as you were talking, trying to find my slides of some of our trainers so I can remember whose work it is so that I can refer them correctly. Um, but there's, um, there's some really good work around just leadership in general. And I think a lot of what we talk about in leadership is actually communication and um, relationship building which terry has touched on in the con in the um in the comments as well essentially building relationships is always the pinnacle you know if you've got a good positive relationship with someone um and they see you in a positive light um you're always going to have more influence um in that situation but also it, it's it's helpful then to get the information back from them they're more forthcoming to tell you what they like and what they don't like so then you probably have to worry less about communication because you know they're going to like it before you roll it out if that makes sense so that's kind of being a bit more people centered uh, i'm desperately scrolling through my slides to try and find it and i can't find it but um essentially a lot of work in in, in uh, leadership talk about how we influence people sometimes we influence just on hierarchy so we just literally um kind of get expect people to listen to us because i'm the boss right which is it kind of works but like it's never going to be sustainable um then we would do it on like something which i struggle to pronounce which is reciprocity which is basically i'll do you a favor you do me a favor um but actually if we actually just start building positive relationships with people listening to what they want 
and then engaging them in the job. Um, I always think that's better. One of my favorite kind of psychological theories would probably be the IKEA effect, um, which essentially if you build a piece of furniture yourself, uh, you like it a lot more and you put a lot more value on it. So if you take a piece of um, work within safety, if you want someone to buy into it a little bit more, um, involve them in it, make them part of that process and they will they will buy into it because ultimately they've built it with you. Um, so I would kind of say comms is kind of the, the last bit. If we do all a bit before, we, we tend to be a bit better uh, on that stuff. But definitely... Um, the, the big shout out to Peter around communication strategy, but then also an, another communication, I'm sorry, another shout out to Peter would be, I, he's the only safety professional I know that actually consulted with a brand specialist, a branding specialist to help him brand the management system before he came came over to to us in consulting um so he actually kind of got a communication and marketing and branding specialist to help him design his his management system essentially all of his stuff within safety um to ensure it kind of went out in a, in a more kind of tangible or kind of a understandable way or more kind of easy to communicate way I'm pretty sure that's Pete give me a thumbs up in the comments if it was you Pete if it's not then I've just given you someone else's work was it Pete? Yeah, it was Pete. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, like the, there's some really good things that Peter had done, which I, I think is absolutely amazing. But ultimately, I think if we were a bit more people centered, we, we, we would do, much, do a much better job on that as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely a, a, a key takeaway. And um, I'm conscious of time, so I won't, I won't yeah. delve too much into, into this with my own thoughts. But I'm always happy to have that conversation uh, offline uh, with you, Alex, and give you some, some further thoughts on that. Um, listen, James, thank you so much for today. It's been really engaging. Uh, the, the chat's been on fire. Uh, we may have to do another one, I think, yeah. to uh, try and get to some more of the questions. Um, so perhaps we can look to schedule something in uh, yeah, in no, the coming cool. weeks and, uh, and months ahead. Um, just quickly, uh, if people want to learn a bit more and pick up on this conversation and sort of try and go away and implement some of this stuff, uh, what's the best place to for them to go to? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, for rebranding safety, you can literally just Google rebranding safety. Uh, or you can go on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Um, that's where most of our content is. If you've never heard of rebranding safety, there is a metric shit ton of content that you can kind of go through. Uh, I'd probably apologize for the first 12 months worth because I was just an angry young man back then. Um, when we start getting guests on it, it gets a bit better. Um, other other than want... the first guest. Yeah, yeah. After you, Christian, it just went yeah. up from there. Mate. It was. It, was it, it could only go. It could only go in one direction. After me. <laughs> um, it, consulting wise, so the scorecard and the, the the guidebook and the framework and all the stuff we talk about, we've got some like products and stuff in there. That would be um, www.riskfluentltd.com. So riskfluentlimited.com. Um, please add me, Peter, Sherry, or Carly on on LinkedIn, and um, and all of us will kind of talk to you and have a chat about this stuff. Um, and then for our app is riskassessor.net. So that's our risk assessment app, riskassessor.net. Uh, and like I say, just, just add me on LinkedIn. I'm always up for a chat. Uh, Pete's put some um, LinkedIn uh, for the risk limit page in the comments as well just now. Thank you for that, Pete. Um, but yeah, that's it. Good stuff. Well, thanks very much, James. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody, for the um, high levels of engagement. Um, it's obviously a topic that's resonating. So let's carry on this discussion uh, on LinkedIn and elsewhere. And we'll pick it up again with James, I'm sure, uh, in the future, perhaps when part two of his uh, his um, guidebook or whatever the right terminology is comes out. Uh, in the it's meantime, um, yes, in the meantime, thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Really enjoyed it. And um, we will look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks on the Safety Roundtable. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for joining us on the Safety and Risk Success podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. Does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.